what I'd like to talk about today is how the computer talks or the CPU talks to the outside world, where the outside world is maybe the keyboard that you're typing on or the floppy disk that you're loading, you know, the games from, or actually the cassette tape, if we're, you know, the era of the t-shirt that I'm we're wearing, you know, <laughs> certain age of us knows the pain and suffering of screeching noises to load a game from tape. Anything that's in the outside world, basically. Our sort of story so far is we have our, our robot and he has his abacus and he has his pigeonholes and he has a few bits of paper that have like some really important pieces of information, the registers, that's like which instruction he's going to, f the, the, the location in the pigeonholes of the next f instruction he's going to fetch, um, various sort of in progress calculations that we called registers and other bits and pieces. So that's the story so far. But first of all, I have to admit that I've been telling a little bit of a white lie. So the pigeonholes don't live in most computers, don't live inside the CPU. They are actually outside. So in essence, the pigeonholes themselves are the very first peripheral, the first outside world thing that we've been talking to. It's just I haven't really classed it as that. Now, when we talked about caches that time, we did sort of allude to it a little bit that it's like a physical chip, that it's, it takes a long time to get the information to and from. And so we had some, some cache memory. And, and sometimes the cache memory is actually inside the CPU and next to the CPU. But we're not going to talk about that part today. But so first of all, I want to explain how our robot in his CPU world, our CPU robot, how he talks to the, the memory. And so I've got an analogy for you. Of course I have. Um, so the robot lives inside a room and poor robot doesn't get to go outside the room, unfortunately. Uh, so we're going to draw our robot with his funny ears and he's inside a room and I'm going to leave a little hatch over here. Oh, I'm not very good at 3D. I should have thought about how I was going to draw this before I just came in and drew it, right? But I'm going to have two wi like windows. <laughs> this is terrible. Um, this will be fixed in post by a very good animator, I'm sure. Um, so maybe these should be drawn like here. In fact, I'm going to draw them there and there. So this is us looking in from the outside world, our poor robot. He has got his abacus in there with him, and he's got his various bits of paper that have the, you know, the accumulator register and the program counter and the flags, all the things we've talked about before, right? So those are, that, that remains. But that's it. That's all he's got inside his little... I keep on, I'm going to say room. I keep wanting to say prison, because, but that sounds a little bit too mean to him. He's quite happy there. These two windows allow the robot to communicate with the outside world. And we're going to call one of them address and the other one data. Now, this address window is a window that the robot can hold up a card with a number written on it for the outside world to see. And we're going to talk about what the outside world looks like in a second. The other window is more like a serving hatch, such as a 1970s house may have. Uh, <laughs> again, if we talk about the era where the spectrum reigned, then many of us grew up in houses where there was a little serving hatch between the kitchen and the dining room. Anyway, I'm really showing my age now. But the, the serving hatch is two-way. I can put things out. I can actually put a number in the data window, or I can expect someone else to put a number to come the other way. And so this is sort of a two-way window hatch and this is a window where I just put a number up. And so every time the robot wants to talk to the memory, the pigeonholes, he's going to hold up a number in the address window and then outside in the outside world there is a separate pigeonhole area which I'm going to draw over here and in Hopefully it's visible. And so there's our pigeonhole over here. And there's some kind of, I, I suppose it's another robot if we're going to go with robot. So this is the CPU robot over here. And we're going to have like the the memory or RAM robot over here, which, you know, if I could draw a robot sheet, then it would be one of those, obviously. All he does is he looks out and every time he sees an address in the window, in the room where the CPU is, he checks to see if it's a number that corresponds to one of the many, many, many pigeonholes that he has access to. And if it is, he goes and gets the number out and he puts it through the data serving hatch here. So that's one of the reasons why this takes time. All of the things that a robot's doing inside of the, his room, he can do quite quickly. Everything that involves communication with the outside world is a kind of a little bit of a, I have to wait for the other side to sort of respond to me. Now, that's when you're trying to read from the memory. We put the address up. There's probably another little flag over here that says read or write, right? And he kind of holds up a read flag or a write flag so that the, the, the people on the outside can tell the difference between either the robot is, the, the CPU is trying to write to memory or read from memory. And I'm saying memory here, but what I really mean is just write to a number. As far as the CPU is concerned, it's just reading and writing from some address. And it may be memory, it may be a pigeonhole, but it may not be. Um, 
for example, a quite reasonable way for us to allow you to type messages on a physical keyboard is to have a physical keyboard over here, which is a matrix of buttons, and each one of those is wired into a single switch. And if the switch, I can't draw switches, but you can imagine a switch has been drawn there. And we can sort of say, there's another robot here, the keyboard robot, and he looks out for a very special number. And that number is say one million. It's just a magic number, one million. If the number one million comes up, that doesn't correspond to any of the memory in our pigeonholes. And so the pigeonhole robot's like, this isn't for me. But the keyboard robot goes, ah, this is my time to shine. And he looks at all the switches and he does some kind of encoding. In binary, it makes a lot of sense with switches, but it's just a number that represents which switches are pressed down and which switches are up. So there's no real memory there. We're not storing any information. The, if anything, the information is stored in whether you're holding a key down or not, like literally. And then he puts the, the encoding of that number back inside the data hatch. So, and you could imagine there could be many other peripherals around here, like the disk drive, you know, is the disk drive spinning yes or no? We could say, okay, that's one million and one. A disk drive robot goes, oh, if it's one million and one, I'll re give you a, a one value when you ask to read um, if the disk drive is spinning or a zero value if it isn't spinning. And also the disk drive, you could write a value to one million and one. And the, if you write a one, to one million one, the disk drive robot goes, okay, I better turn the motor on, I suppose. And so it spins the motor up. And so you can see how you could communicate for it with the CPU to these various peripherals around the outside. So that's great. And that's fairly much how it does work. But there's a couple of snags. The first thing is, if you've got lots of peripherals around the outside here, how does the CPU know to check them? Now with a keyboard, you could make the argument that you just check very regularly, like, Every, you know, but if you imagine you're writing a program, for example, our very our now famous um, uh, uh, sequence Fibonacci sequence program, and maybe you wanted to say keep write keep writing out numbers until the escape key has been pressed, that means that me as the Fibonacci program writer, I have to check to see whether or not the escape key is being pressed every time round I catch that loop. I write my little loop, and then at the end of the loop, I go and read one address one million. And if it happens to be 27 or whatever it is, then I guess we should stop now. And that's kind of tiresome. It puts a huge burden of responsibility on everybody who's writing a program to forever check for the keys. And if you've ever like used a, a modern computer and you started typing while a program is busy, sometimes you've typed a bunch of things and they haven't even appeared on the screen yet. But when finally the computer starts responding again, all those numbers appear, sorry, all those letters you typed in appear. It's so like something was going on while you were typing. And so, what happens is there is another mechanism. When the keys are pressed down, this robot wants to attract the attention of the CPU and wants to say, hey, something important has happened. You should take a note of this immediately. Drop what you're doing and just deal with me right now, please. That is an interrupt. And I'm gonna signify it by giving our CPU just another couple of sort of capabilities that he didn't have beforehand. So the first thing is he's gonna have a bell and I'm going to, oh, that's not too bad. There you go, that looks like a bell, doesn't it? A bell, like a doorbell on the outside. And he's also got a do not disturb flag. And now when I hit a key on the keyboard, the keyboard scanning robot rings the bell to say something interesting happened. Now, it do, the, the CPU doesn't know who rang the bell. It's a bit like that, that terrible game that kids play where you ring the do doorbell and run away. But he knows that something important has happened in the system. But how does the CPU take advantage of this information? Well, so what happens when you, when you cause an interrupt, when you ring the bell, if it's in do not disturb mode, unsurprisingly, nothing happens. Although it does remember that the bell was rung and it comes back to it later. A little bit of circuitry on the outside basically hangs on to the fact that the bell was rung, but nobody has acknowledged that the bell was rung. When the bell is rung and you, and you weren't in do not disturb mode, then the first thing that happens is that the CPU goes into do not disturb mode to stop further bells from causing you to have to interrupt yourself from what you were doing. And then the very next thing it does is it's as if the CPU was forced to execute a call instruction to a very magic special location. And that depends on from, from computer to computer how that 
what number that is or how that's uh, set or whatever, but let's just say it's 1,000 because the numbers are easy like this. And so it's as if the CPU robot ignores the next instruction that he was going to execute and he executes a call 1,000 instruction with the do not disturb flag on. Now, if we can arrange for some kind of system that's not my program, some separate sort of system to have a little bit fragment of a program at address 1000 that looks around for all the peripherals and says, who was that? And it kind of asks, was it the disk drive? Was it the tape drive? No. Oh, oh look, wait a second. There's a key pressed down. Well, there wasn't pressed before. It was probably a keyboard in, uh, that, that, that caused that interrupt. So then what it will do is it'll do whatever you need to do. Now that's more complicated in terms of what you do with the key press, but you could at least just note it down somewhere and so that the main program doesn't have to worry about it until you come back round to checking later, right? So rather than checking every single number, you could have, well, or in an operating system sort of set up, you could actually terminate that process or whatever, but we're getting ahead of ourselves there. Um, that, that little fragment of programs responsible for dealing with the peripheral, the minimal amount of things to, uh, to kind of keep the peripheral happy and to note down what happened. And then it immediately clears the do not disturb flag so that another peripheral can potentially wake it up. And then it returns. And so the same process that our call and return that we've talked about before um, happens, it, it sort of happens on our behalf by this interrupt system. So even if we were in the middle of calculating the numbers of our Fibonacci sequence, we would um, be interrupted, go off, handle the fact that a key was pressed, and again, now the interrupt routine, which is what this, sometimes it's called an interrupt service handler or an interrupt routine, the thing at address 1000, that's responsible for making sure it preserves, it pushes all of the registers because like literally you were in the middle of doing something and it has no idea what you were in the middle of doing, but it certainly was important. So you should not change anything. It then takes, uh, takes account of what happened with the peripheral, disk drive, whatever, and then it returns back. And so now we've got a system where the peripherals around the outside can send messages back to the CPU, interrupting it to do useful work. And we're starting to see that like general programs that you might be writing, like our Fibonacci program or whatever, there's kind of like some kind of system program that would be convenient to have loading. And that is essentially what an operating system is. When we think about operating systems, be it Linux or Windows or Mac OS or whatever, one of the many things that the, the kernel of the operating system provides is all of these support harnesses that deal with the outside world and drivers and all that kind of nonsense. And what they're really doing is responding to these interrupts that are coming in from the outside world. And also they understand each device that's plugged in around the outside and how to communicate with it when it causes an interrupt. I suppose we should also talk about another way that devices can interact with the CPU. And that is some devices live kind of outside of the CPU. They're like, a, I know we're talking about like these sort of arcane old devices really here, but like a webcam is a great example. So I'm looking at you through a webcam right now and a staggering amount of information is being generated by that camera and it would be incredibly painful if for every color of every pixel as it's scanning across the screen it was interrupting the cpu saying hey i've got a red pixel for you i've got a red and you're like no i can't do any meaningful work while you're doing that similarly um if they had to store the whole picture or a sequence of pictures on the webcam then every webcam would have gigabytes of RAM just to store the image that was going on. And that seems like a waste, every peripheral. So what some devices can do, so we're gonna draw a little webcam here. That's not terrible, is it? Look, it's more like a old school camera than it is a camera. What that webcam will do is it can actually talk directly to the RAM itself. So it can go behind the CPU's back and it can start streaming and writing in the colors of the image that it's seeing into a certain area of memory that's configurable. And then once it's finished the whole picture, then it sends an interrupt and says, hey, just so you know, I filled in another picture and now the CPU can get to look at the whole picture and do its compression or whatever. And obviously this is a huge simplification again, but this is called DMA or direct memory access. And these sort of faster devices like your hard disk reader, like your, your, your webcam or whatever, will use DMA to send mess, uh, the data directly into memory. And then they kind of say politely cough, <clears throat> ring the bell and let the CPU know that they've done the work that was asked of them. So with that, we now actually have a pretty good understanding of all the things that go on inside a modern computer. And you know, these serving hatches that I've been talking about here, or these address windows here, 
those are real things. So I'm, although I'm wearing a Spectrum T-shirt, which had a Z80 in it, I have uh, a 6502 here, which is a little bit small. I'll hold it up to this camera in case that's a better shot. So this is a 6502 CPU. This is like actually what was driving in the, the BBC Micro or the Apple II or what else? Uh, it was in at least, oh, the Commodore 64, which is like another classic machine. And these pins on the outside are the windows. Like, the address bus is 16 bits worth of information. So it's got 16 binary digits worth. So 16 of these pins are the 16 part, like digits of the address that it's interested in. Another eight are the data hatch, which is either way, you know, data can go in or data can come out. There's some power rails on this. And then there's a couple of things for clocks. But that's effectively it. So our poor CPU robot trapped in here, the size of my thumb, of my little fingernail inside here, can only see the outside world through those pins. Oh, and there's the one interrupt pin as well, two interrupt pins, in fact, because there's something else called NMIs, which we don't need to go to now. But like, that's it. And with that, you can build a computer. Once I realized that like that's how computers worked, it was like, hey, this is how we go from this very abstract system where we have these rules and we've got memory and they're pigeonholes and just numbers move around to, oh, now I can actually use the numbers in boxes or not in boxes, you know, virtual boxes as these things are, to do something interesting in the real world, spin a disk drive, read a keyboard, uh, and how we do that without, um, without having every program ever having to deal with all the peripherals all the time. So this is like where the, the boundary between the physical CPU and its registers, which it has exactly one stack pointer. So that CPU has one stack pointer. Um, the calling convention, which explains where things are going to go and whatever, is more of a convention that is not...